Hello and welcome to Chapter 3, Key Issue 4, Why Do Migrants Face Obstacles? What keeps people from being able to move? Well, these obstacles, they're called intervening obstacles. It's when you have an environmental or political feature that hinders migration, something that stops you from being able to move. Traditionally, the obstacle was the environment. For example, if you had a long journey, you might have to cross an ocean or mountains, and we didn't have the infrastructure to get you through those conditions very quickly. Maybe there was a very cramped scenario where you're on a ship for weeks or months at a time. So your obstacle was the distance. Today, the obstacles are more political, like borders. What's going to keep you out uh, legally? So, for example, we look at Tijuana, Mexico, and San Diego. Here's Mexico over here. Here's the USA. And you can see that this border is backed all the way up into Mexico for a distance here because people are waiting to get through the border to immigrate into the United States of America. Another obstacle for immigrants is quota laws. Quota is, the, is something that sets maximum limits on the number of people who could immigrate to the U.S. during a year. So back in the 17, 18, earliest 1900s, there was no quota laws. Anybody who wanted to move to the United States, you just come on in. Well, in 1921, they initiated the Quota Act and the National Origins Act in 1924, and it limited people. It became an intervening obstacle. So this is the first legal action to limit people coming into the country. You know, basically, it was designed to allow people of European descent to come into the country, but it was meant to keep out people from other regions because they were used to people of similar backgrounds being in the United States, but they didn't necessarily want people who were different to come in. And over the years, you can see how this kind of changed. For example, in 1965, they changed it um, from quotas for certain regions, but then they replaced it with hemisphere quotas. And even that though, though, though was still um, biased because you see how they allowed in 170,000 people from the Eastern Hemisphere and only 120,000 from the Western Hemisphere, meaning Latin Americans would have been limited as opposed to other people. In 1978, they changed it to just a straight up top quota of 290,000 people, 20,000 max per country, so it was a lot more even. And then in 1990, they just raised it to a global quota, 700,000 people from any country. Um, for all countries total. However, this quota, keep in mind, does not apply to refugees because as a refugee, you can get in and your number does not count. Um, and there's also preferences to who gets in first. For example, if you are applying to be uh, an immigrant to the United States and you already have family that lives in the United States, you're going to get preference because they want to reunify your family. Another thing is if you're a skilled worker, you're going to have a much better chance of getting into the United States because your skills could be used here. They're more likely to bring in a doctor than to allow in someone who doesn't really have any skills and would work maybe in lawn care. And then diversity. The interesting thing is maybe you are a doctor, but you're from a white European country, and maybe they're saying, well, we need more diversity, so we're going to let a doctor in from India, for example. So these are the parameters and uh, things that they're thinking about when we set up the quota acts. What we, what we look at um, are two things about migrants coming into the United States. One of them is brain drain. What we mean is we're getting a whole bunch of very intelligent, highly skilled people that are leaving a country. So for example, if you are a country in Asia, but all of your smart, talented, and skilled people are leaving to the United States because they're finding better job opportunities and more money there, what we're creating is a situation of brain drain because your population is not gaining the benefit of the smart, skilled, and talented people. They're li I mean, literally, you're draining your brain power of your country. The other thing we look at is chain migration. When we see international migrants move between countries, we usually see a situation where they all end up in a very similar area together. Because doesn't it make sense that people who are relatives want to live near each other if you're coming to a completely new country? Or if, if you're all Chinese, it makes sense that naturally you would all want to locate in the similar areas. So that makes sense. If you were traveling across the earth, wouldn't you want to uh, 
uh, link up with people who are like-minded, who are similar to you, who have been from the same country because they have the same experience. Ellis Island. This is a unique situation where during a certain time period, 1892 to 1954 in New York Harbor, we had 12 million immigrants came through this facility to immigrate to the United States. Um, it, it's not there. It's not in use anymore. It, it's, it is there as a monument, but it's not in use anymore. And it wasn't in use before the 1890s. Most of these people coming through Ellis Island down here, they were from Europe. The thing is, even if you made it all the way across the ocean, the uh, people who are running Ellis Island, they still might turn you away. Like, you would have to leave and go all the way back on your ship. And it was miserable conditions on the ship. Sometimes it took two weeks. Sometimes it took two months. It just depended. And you could be in cramped quarters. And imagine getting all the way over to the United States and being turned around at Ellis Island saying you have to go back. Reasons why they were turned around is because sometimes they wanted to ask if you had a job. If you had a job lined up, cool, you're able to take care of yourself financially and you wouldn't become a burden to the United States. If you didn't have a job, they might send you back. They wanted to know if you had family that already lived in the United States. If not, they might send you back if you're nobody with no connections. And certainly, they checked for diseases like trachoma, which is an eye disease. And if you had those, they would send you all the way back. Um, so a lot of the times, family members would get separated. They might let in four members of your family and you being the father, perhaps, you didn't get in because maybe you had trachoma and eye disease or maybe you didn't have enough money. They'd send you all the way back. So it was a situation where if you had family that already lived in New York, when they greeted you after you made it through, through New York Island, it was tears of joy or it could have been tears of extreme despair and sadness as they sent you back. Fun fact that Rubenstein presents in his textbook. There was debate for years who, who actually owned Ellis Island. The, su the Supreme Court decided in 1998 that New York owns the original island, but gave the expanded lands around the island to New Jersey. So here's Manhattan, New York, and they own the actual original island here. But New Jersey is another state right here. It claims to have owned the new additions to the island that they built up over time. And it stands today. Unauthorized immigration. This is where we have immigrants entering a country without proper documents. In the United States, there are 11.2 million unauthorized immigrants as of 2010, according to the Pew Hispanic Center. 58% of these unauthorized immigrants are from Mexico. The rest are from other Latin American countries and countries around the globe. One million of these are children. That's a lot. Think about that. One million are children. They came over illegally, unauthorized. However, if you have a parent that comes over to the United States and a child is born, they are automatically citizens. So that becomes a problem as well because you have people who are unauthorized and yet their children, however many of them, they become full U.S. citizens. So over time you can see how that population of people gains influence. What they're also noticing is that the duration of stay of immigrants has increased over the years. They don't just stay and work for a little bit and go back. More and more they just stay. Eight million of these unauthorized immigrants are employed in the U.S., which creates 5% of the total U.S. civilian labor force. So 5% of our entire population is unauthorized immigrants. These immigrants, they work in mainly blue-collar jobs, such as construction and hosp hospitality, jobs that typically people in this country uh, think of as uh, not wanting to do because we go traditionally for more things like teachers and lawyers and doctors and technicians. So there's benefits and drawbacks to allowing immigrants to come in to work to jobs that maybe we don't want. The largest places where you're seeing unauthorized immigration is California and Texas. Let's think about it. They're right there on the borders. Mexico's border. It is 1,951 miles long, going all the way across the southwestern portion of the United States. The thing is, the barrier wall covers only one-fourth of the border. That's not very much. It's just 25% of this entire landmass that you see, all of North America, except which gets caught off by the Gulf of Mexico. This border, it runs through sparsely inhabited regions where there's not very many people. If you're out here in the desert, or out here in the desert, there's not a lot of people that are going to watch over the border. And in a lot of cases, there's no wall at all. It's just open desert. So the border in rural areas and small towns is guarded by only a handful of agents because, let's face it, that's a long border. Um, there's a lot of money that has to go into protecting the border. 
And you end up with a situation that looks like this, Tecate, Mexico, and California. Here's USA, California. Here's Mexico. I mean, it's not going to take much to get over the border, really. Characteristics of immigrants in the USA. Well, when we look at what Ravenstein said in his uh, characteristics of migrants, he says that most are long-distance migrants, and they're male. Because if you're traveling a long ways, you're going for work, and most jobs traditionally have been done by men. Um, over the course of history, that's changed, but Ravenstein's characteristics were that it was male who were traveling long distances, and the other thing is they're usually adult individuals, so male adult individuals, traditionally. However, what we see in the United States is 40% are young adults from ages 25 through 39. That makes sense, right, because they're the ones that are able to travel and work the jobs. Of course, immigrants are less likely to be elderly people. They're going to be too old to work, too old to travel. Too old to take risks, really. But now, more immigrants are coming over with their mothers. Families are coming over. Um, and the, the characteristics is that recent immigrants have attended less school. So they're not as educated as people are in the United States. They're coming over to find the jobs and work the jobs that the educated populations of the United States are not necessarily wanting to work. So the change that has happened is the gender of the migrants. It used to be that it was young working class males that come over. But as of 1990, what Rubenstein and his research has found is that it's more female now. We've had populations of males coming over here. Now it's switched over uh, to the females who have come to catch up with their male counterparts. But also gender roles have changed in the United States and in Mexico to where it's not necessarily females that stay home and watch over the kids and have babies and work in the home. They're workers as well. And that's why it's swapped. Concerns about immigrants in the USA. You got Americans who are divided on the benefits and drawbacks of immigration. Because as we said, in the workplace, these immigrants come in to fill jobs that potentially nobody wants. Let's face it, who wants to grow up to be uh, in the lawn care jobs? Well, it doesn't seem like very many do. Um, but we do want our lawns mowed, right? So we need someone to do it. So it's, it's uh, benefits and drawbacks of the workplace. Border patrols. The concern is, do we need more border patrols? Do we need more uh, security on the border? Do we want to keep um, unauthorized immigrants from getting in? That's a concern to a lot of people. On the one hand, we cherish the diversity of immigration. This is a country of immigrants here in the United States. But on the other hand, we want to be safe and we want to make sure we have enough jobs for the people who are already here. Civil rights. Um, you think about the state of Arizona, who came up with a law where it's totally okay to pull people over if they look like an illegal immigrant. And on the one hand, you're like, well, we want to be safe, so let's check and make sure that everyone is legally in the right place. But at the other perspective, we're United States citizens. We thrive. We have fought for our history to be free so that we don't have police forces and government agencies pulling us over at random to check on who we are. And then local initiatives. A lot of people feel like the borders is a federal responsibility or a national responsibility. And some people feel like it's local. So these are all concerns that we talk about in human geography, which is why I love this class. Immigration concerns in Europe. Sources of people migrating in Europe typically come from southeastern and eastern Europe where you've got these eastern and southeastern European countries and middle eastern countries that don't have the job opportunities. That are, that are coming in, in the masses to Western Europe where they have the development and the jobs. Opponents to immigration in Europe are similar to what we have in the United States. People don't want their traditions and cultures to be threatened. Um, Europe is traditionally white and they have their backgrounds and they don't necessarily want um, people from Eastern European and Middle Eastern traditions coming in to change their culture and speak different languages and have different religions. I mean, you think about chain migration for migrants coming into the United States. They want to be with people who are similar. Well, it's the same situation here in Europe. They feel threatened. Uh, they see crime go up, perhaps, with immigration. They don't want people coming in and living off the welfare of the state and having to pay more taxes because of that. And if there is a situation of unemployment, they don't want immigrants coming in and taking the jobs in the first place. So it's, it's similar to what we're seeing in the United States. The interesting point is that Europeans throughout history have brought their culture across the earth. It's spread out, it's diffused across the earth, specifically to North America. So just like the United States, Europe is concerned about the immigration situation, but at the same time, 
they were immigrants throughout history and spread their culture elsewhere as well. So it's a really interesting dynamic. I know a lot of us want to preserve our safety and our culture. At the same time, we're immigrants ourselves. Our families have come over to the United States before us, and we thrive on the principle of the Statue of Liberty that says, give us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses. We want to bring people in and welcome them. What's the proper balance? I don't have that answer. But those are things we talk about in AP Human Geography.